Okay. So welcome to lecture one of ECE, ECE uh, 2305. Okay. So in this lecture, what we're going to be covering essentially is uh, the beginning of this course, uh, what's its purpose, and really give sort of that perspective of what is communications and networks. So for anyone that's interested in communications and networks, but say you don't have all the mathematical tools, perhaps you have a, you know, sort of like a few ECE courses under your belt, and you know what communications are, but you want to get a better idea of what is all this stuff. Like for instance, if you open up your computer, suppose you have Linux, suppose you have Windows or a Mac, and then they say, oh, um, you know, uh, what's your IP address, right? What's DHCP? Uh, what does it mean to route? Uh, like, you know, doing routing and stuff. What's a router? What's a switch? What's packet switch versus circuit switch? And all these other terms. This course is designed specifically for that audience, okay? So in this lecture, really, we're going to talk about what is comms? What is communications? And, uh, you know, the funny thing is uh, communications has many different connotations. <coughs> we'll then talk about the communications model, okay? There is a model, surprisingly. Followed by my favorite topic, the transmission medium. Again, we're going to go into more detail on each one of these topics, but I want to sort of give a little bit of a heads up. Hey, um, look at this. Check out that. We're going to also talk about networks, and the, there are a variety of different networks. I'm pointing out a few here, but there are others. And then finally, talk about the internet. All right? So a lot of words. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to read, right? Uh, I, I'm assuming all of you can do that, and I'll let you all look at it for a minute. No, just kidding. So uh, what is communication? I'm doing that right now, right? I am the transmitter. I'm supposedly communicating some sort of useful information to all of you, right? And I'm broadcasting this over the air using sound waves, and then your receivers are picking it up, and it's being processed, right? Simple. So what communication is is the ability for information of some sort to be generated, broadcast over a medium, and then successfully, that's the important word, successfully decoded at the receiver, right? It's useless if, let's say, I'm, like, you know, like, for instance, I'm not sure how many of you watch The Simpsons, but, you know, Santa's a little helper, right? The, uh, the little uh, greyhound dog and stuff, and Homer tells Santa, uh, Santa's little helper, like, you know, bad dog, bad dog, you shouldn't have gone on that carpet or something like that. And all the, all the Santa little helper just hears, wah, 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 wah. Is that message received? Is that communications? No, that's an epic failure of communications right there. Same thing with my dog. No, Captain, don't eat that uh, plate of food and stuff. And it's probably the same thing. He just looks at me, although I suspect I am successfully communicating with him, but he's playing dumb, you know. So communication takes a lot of forms. There's human communications, right? And it's usually achieved with things like speech communications, right? And our brains process this speech communications. There's also linguists that, like, depending if you're in Russia or China, in the US, Canada, where I'm from, uh, France, like all these different places have different languages, but also, let's say, body language, right? Just visually, like you look at me and you say, okay, this guy must be like this excited, and you would be right, right? And so I'm communicating my, my passion about this class, right? Seeing your laughter, you're communicating your, your, your pleasure with my joke that I, you know, just, just spoke, right? So there's this, there is this, um, there, there is uh, that sort of visual communication. There's also communication in a more passive sense. When you're driving and you see a stop sign, a stoplight, Bear, like, you know, um, route two, turn this way, right? And so, like, you know, I get that, and all of us get that. From an electronic standpoint, it's a little different, okay? So it's a, little, it's a little different because what happens is our brains can fill in stuff, right? We have memory. We, we have past experiences that sort of fill in, and we grow and understand a little bit more sophisticated as time goes along communicating, right? Radios... For the most part, even if a lot of them are, have computers in them, they are not very intelligent, right? They're only as good as the engineer or technologist that implements them, right? And so that's the challenge. So you have the, let's say, hardware guy, or you have the um, signal processing and digital communications algorithms guy. 
And what they do, what those folks do, is they come up with techniques to try and eliminate as much error as possible in the transmission. Because what happens is, you can hear me clearly. In fact, I just looked at my course evaluations from last term's class, and one student said, consistent loudness. So that, that was a description of me. And so I'm not sure if I'm loud, but um, actually I text my wife that, and she says, someone else that agrees with me. Yay! So, but what happens is you can hear me clearly. Put a jet engine next to me, and now what I'm saying, every second word you might not hear, right? Because there's that big engine droning noise, right? Radios have the exact same thing. Radios, the wireless communications we're used to, have tons of interference all around them, which affects reception and what did I say? Success, successful decoding. What does successful decoding mean? It means that the message is completely reconstructed at the receiver without any sort of cheating, any side channels or anything like that. On the networking side, you'll have tons of drop packets. You're going to have lots of corruption along the way. Like, you know, for instance, network hiccups and disturbances in, in the architecture overall. And that can result in distortion of the message being received. Again, what happens is the network engineer will come up with ways to mitigate that. So the bottom line is, is that for a communication, the real goal is this last guy, which is the reproduction. I don't like saying reproduction. Reproduction assumes like it, you know, it's a totally like, you know, sort of static environment and everything's uh, immaculate and it's ideal. It is not. And I would like to sort of, instead of calling it reproduce, I would say that a receiver is trying to intelligently guess what the transmitter is sending. Right? So that's what communication really is. And it's human communication when we have a lot of noise, um, electronic communication, wired or wireless networks. Right? And why is this important? Why are all of you here? Okay? And part of it I'm hoping is because you find the topic really exciting. But it's also the fact that we're seeing lots of communications out there in the world, right? So, like for instance, all of you probably have smartphones. All of you probably have laptops with Wi-Fi. All of you, well, maybe not all of you, might have Bluetooth devices. You probably have your own wireless local area network at home or in your apartment. And then if you turn on your Wi-Fi on your laptop, you have 20 other folks in the neighboring apartments that also have Wi-Fi networks of their own, right? And we have cellular networks. We have LTE. LTEA, we have GSM, we have 3G, we have 4G, we have all these guys. We're surrounded, we're buried in wireless, right? And so that demand, okay, alone is reason enough for looking at wireless connectivity, like, you know, looking at communications and networks. Like, you know, and the thing is, what, what we have to look at is that Wi-Fi is not the only wireless technology. That's why single-handedly, I don't want to use Wireshark too much in this class because it's really designed specifically for things like Wi-Fi and uh, access points and the like. And the reason is there's more to communications and networks than just Wi-Fi. Like for instance, uh, how many RBE people here? I'm just going to like tease you guys. Okay, tease. Ah, uh, like you shouldn't raise your hand. No, just kidding. So, so the thing is, I'm not sure what course it is, but they're in the. Um, Robot, robotics area below my office, like on the first floor of AK, I think there's like about a dozen Wi-Fi access points connected to robots or something. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's like when I see something like something like GearsLAN and RoboLAN and da 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 da, I'm like, like what's going on? It could also be P Professor Padir's lab too. So I don't know. <laughs> and that's that's Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Okay, so that that's not what I'm picking up. I'm picking up. Wi-Fi signals, but Bluetooth is okay. So, so who's using Wi-Fi? Yes. And that's what, the, yeah, because a lot of people said turtle bots. Okay, hallelujah. Thank you. So that's the thing. There's more to there's more to communications and networks than a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Bluetooth is a good choice if it's low bandwidth. And you might say, what 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 does Wiglinski mean by bandwidth? You'll learn that in this class. But what happens is, what, the reason why like, you know, this course exists is to expose you guys more to, to just Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. There is, a, there is a lot of wireless standards, more than you can possibly count. And of course, you know, 
wireless LANs and LANs in general are very popular, but there are other considerations. There are other wireless platforms and communication platforms out there. And the need is for things like the TurtleBot, like things like, for instance, there's something called connected vehicles, which in about a few years, your cars will be equipped with wireless connectivity. And what is it going to be connected to? Other cars. Because I'm not sure how you were driving this winter, but I could not see around those snow mountains, right? And imagine your car says, car approaching in five, four, three, two, one. And you don't know. You don't see the car, and then vroom, it passes in front of you. Wireless connectivity. And the government is thinking about mandating that in 2016, 2017 model cars. And that's just one application. There's SATCOM. Um, of course, swarms. You talk about drone swarms. You talk about, let's say, next generation of jet fighters. Uh, there's even underwater communications and multiple, let's say, uh, U, uh, USVs, I think they're called, and like you know, wirelessly connected and performing actions underneath the water, right? So there's a lot of demand, and so you need to understand how does a communication system work in general, whether it's Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and the like. And so this is where I start doodling. Oh, yes. This is where I start drawing. Brace yourselves, folks. All right. Do, 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 do. OK. So the basic, comms, the basic comms diagram of any sort of communication system communication system. Actually, my, one of my colleagues, he absolutely hates this interface because that little red dot that says you're, you're getting close to the screen, he says it's almost like a sniper laser or something like that. It's like, you're almost going to go on the screen. There. Okay. So every communication system, and you know, you would be surprised what is a communication system. So you, in every communication system, what you've got, so here's my comm speak, is You've got a source. Okay? This is your information source. Usually, if you're a communications engineer, right, this is often binary, one or zero. And then it goes through what we call a transmitter. It's, the shorthand is TX. It's not Texas. It means it's shorthand for tra transmitter. So your information, your binary information, gets fed into a, tran a transmitter, and then the transmitter, so we're, let's say we make a wireless communication system, but wired is about the same. So this is a symbol for an antenna. Antenna. And then let's say you have another antenna. Rx is not a prescription. Rx is a receiver. And then it goes into um, either what you could call a destination or... It's also known as a sink, right? So source, that's where information comes from, goes through the transmitter. What the transmitter does is it packages that information in such a way that it makes it as resistant as possible to, let's say, all the baddies that occur here. And I'll explain that here in a minute. We call this the channel otherwise known as a medium. The receiver decodes and guesses what the transmitter is doing. So this packages your information, for tr uh, packages for transmission, and this guesses or decodes intercepted signal. And this is sort of your desired or target. Like, that's, that's the application uh, that you want to, uh, t basically, like, what comes out of here is your binary information. And that's where you want to go. Like, like, so for instance, if it's a cell phone, all that binary information, what does it do? That binary information then gets converted through um, a speech decoder, uh, sorry, speech decoder into sound, right? So, you know, your cell phones, they get ones and zeros, and then those ones and zeros form patterns, like code words, that translate into actual, uh, actual sound amplitude levels. And then you can actually hear, let's say, mom's 
voice or my wife's voice or whatever. So what you've got here in between the transmitter and the source and receiver in the sync is this medium. In the wireless domain, the medium okay, is the air. We usually communicate in air, right? In space, well, it's a vacuum. So you're, the medium is the vacuum of space. Some folks actually communicate supposedly in like underwater scenarios, like I just mentioned. But whatever the case, you have the medium, the air medium, and you have electromagnetic pulses, energy propagating through. And what's really cool is that your transmitter packages your ones and zeros in such a way that that electromagnetic energy has a message, right? Very large amplitude followed by very small amplitude might tell the receiver, hey, it's going to be this information, right? So there are ways of manipulating the electromagnetic energy flowing through the air that triggers something at the receiver saying, I think they're sending a one, right? So we won't talk too much about that. That is 3311 stuff, okay? But you should be aware that information that's conveyed from transmitter to receiver over something, the air, if let's say it's wired communications, it's probably copper, it's probably fiber optic, so it's glass, right? It could be any sort of thing. It could be another type of metallic structure. But whatever the case, we call it a medium, a channel. And the goal is this communication system, the goal is from this end to that end, we want success. We want successful transmission. And to have successful transmission means that our message here, which we call X, and the reconstructed message here, X hat, are equal. That is success, i.e., X is equal to X. Actually, X hat is equal to X. When we got that, yay, we're doing great. So that's what a communication system is, like kind of like the generic layout of this. Fine, we'll keep that. So, so I just mentioned it. Wired, there's fiber optic. There's actually fiber optic in WPI. So, mm, no, we don't have any. So, um, let me think. There are a few rooms in Atwater, Kent. If you see, like, you know, there should be like two things that look like Ethernet ports where you plug in your, your, you know, your Ethernet cable. And then you'll find two other ports next to it that have these stupid little white things sticking out. That's a fiber optic connection. And nobody uses fiber because uh, essentially um, Ethernet is fast enough. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, fiber was kind of a bad bet. And, like, you know, people say, well, the next generation of the wired networking is going to be fiber and uh, WPI. It never went anywhere, right? That's the funny thing about technology. Sometimes you bet on the wrong, wrong horse. So fiber optic, coax cable, we don't do deal with that anymore. In the 1990s, this building was probably full of coax cable. We no longer deal with that. Again, it's Ethernet. Um, unshielded twisted pair. So that's a copper wire that um, essentially like, you know, phone wire and such. Um, and then your network, we have sonnets, which we don't use too much. Uh, Ethernet, which is what the standard is now, and um, cable network. Again, we, we don't use too much unless you have cable at home. The wireless network really comes down to propagation of electromagnetic energy, right? And what we're, okay, so we're not going to focus too much about the propagation, but we're really more interested in things like GSM, LTE, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and everything else in between them. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper into this thing called networks. So why do we have networks? It's no fun just having a computer. I want a computer that connects to other computers, right? So the reason why we have networks is because for the most part, we have a lot of computing devices. You know, we have a lot of, like for instance, like if you look at your car, your car has about 100 to 140 embedded systems, processors, computers, devices, all that. Everything from fuel injection, power steering, 
um, um, uh, the ABS braking, even your power windows, your stereo. Each one of these has a computer associated with it. All of them are connected by its own dedicated network. It's not Ethernet either. It's something special called CAN bus, right? And then you might wonder about other things, like let's say swarms of drones, aerial drones performing a task uh, in a coordinated manner. They would not be able to do that unless they can share information with each other. Even here, like for instance, how many of you have gone into the, um, this is an actual question, how many of you have gone to the library and actually checked out a book? Oh my god, okay. So books are not dead, okay. Because honestly, like when I did my master's thesis many, many moons ago, okay, um, 2000. So what happened is I remember I would go into the basement of the engineering library to find some journal, take it, photocopy it, and then bring it back to my office. And then I would like read it carefully and then include it into, or you know, study it, figure out how it applies to my research and stuff. I turn to my grad students now. Oh, go on IEEE Explorer. Click, click, click. Oh, there you go. Right? What happens is that's, that's the power of networking. Information now is at our fingertips. Right? And more and more, everything is becoming digitized. And at the same time, coordinated operations, uh, we're, becoming, we're having more and more sophisticated type of systems that are based on many disjoint systems that are all networked together. Even something like LTE, um, what happens is, for instance, right now in the old days, you had voice communications, and that voice communications was uh, like, you know, you had your, like, uh, actually, this is a good question. I'm actually for, I'm not going to ask if you guys live in apartments, but how many of you personally right now have a landline phone? Okay, but at, at your apartment or at home? Okay, okay, very impressive. Most people, including myself, don't have that, right? What happens is even that landline phone, is it really landline or is it through uh, your internet provider, right? So that's the trickiness. Everyone's now moving away from those dedicated landline type of phones and moving to something that is voice over IP based, right? Including LTE. That's, so some of you might hear about this, Volti. So Volti is voice over LTE. And we'll talk a little bit about it on the next slide. What happens is voice over LTE is sort of like the next generation where everything is a packet. Everything is data. Your speech is data. The stuff you're streaming from YouTube is data. Your email is data. No more are we going to have a separate network for voice communications and for streaming media and for text messaging or whatnot. Everything is one humongous network, right? And so what's happening is this is due, again, in part to the sophistication of these networks and all the protocols that we have behind it. And we're going to be introduced to these throughout the rest of this term. And the terms, like these terms I mentioned at the beginning, pan, lan, man, wan. <clears throat> I'm trying to keep a straight face. But these guys here describe the different types of networks that exist out there and, and the level of sophistication. Personal area networks like Bluetooth, like Zigbee. The network is within 10 meters of me. So let's say I have my Bluetooth headset. Perhaps I have some medical sensors. They're all connected to my cell phone. And they're all internetworked with each other. They're all interconnected with each other. The LAN is like your home. It's about um, 30 to 100 feet in radius. Your entire home is wired or wireless. And you're really, the network is just all the devices within that space. A bunch of computers. Maybe you have a Roku. Uh, you watch Netflix. Uh, you have your laptop. You're, you're doing work at the same time, sending out email and, and the like. The MAN or metropolitan area network is, let's say, a city, in which case you have multiple base stations providing cellular data services. And then finally, you have the wide area network. We're talking really geographically large network, right? Could cover, let's say, part of a state. Okay? So what we have here, and how does that look? Well, I'll show you. What we've got is something that looks like this. So you've got the individual, and they have their Bluetooth, 
they have their laptop, um, let's say they have a Roku and a TV set, and so that's the pan. Well, actually, no, let's say the remote, I take that back, the remote for the Roku. And then the LAN is contained within that. And that could be multiple uh, desktop computers, a server, maybe your TV set, uh, getting data off of the internet and such. The MAN, the Metropolitan Area Network, covers, let's say, a, a town or part of a city. And then the WAN, as you can see, can be quite huge. Part of a country, part of a state, um, trans transcends multiple cities and such. So what happens is, again, you might be seeing something interesting here. Communication systems, there's lots of layers, there's lots of modules, things are built on top of each other, and the reason is they tend to be complex systems. So there's a, there's a saying called divide and conquer. So what communication systems do is they take that complexity and break it down, such that you can actually, um, one person can focus on one part and another person can focus on another. Yes? Ah, uh, so, so what does WAN port stand for on, on uh, there in that case? Is it wireless access network or a wide area network? I'm not sure it's the input or it's how it's the stream of data it gets from the modem or yep. the rest of the provider. Yeah, so, um, so this was on, on which? On, the, on your laptop or? On your router. On your router. So, yes. So, th yeah, so th that's the thing. So, um, yeah, so if it's on your router and then it's connected, let's say that cable goes out to your service provider, then, yeah, that, that could be in the case of, let's say, a cable network. So, for instance, a cable network, the way things are set up in the United States is, especially in a town base, you might say, why isn't Comcast and Charter in the same town? And they usually have these agreements where they say, we'll invest money to build out the entire town with a cable network, but... We have exclusive rights to it, but we will build out to the entire town. So you're right. So like from that perspective, it's from your router connected to, let's say, Charter or Comcast. That would be a wide area network. So they wouldn't use MAN per se, but MAN and WAN kind of interchange. But WAN can be like town level or much wider. Great point. Thank you. Okay. All right. So. It's getting hot in here. Yeah, 86 people produce a lot of heat. <laughs> so, um, the one thing I wanted to bring, and I think I mentioned this at the beginning in one of my blurbs, is I talk about circuit switch, packet switch, frame relay. Well, I mentioned the first two, circuit switch and packet switch. You might say, uh, what, what is that? So, I'll, I'll get to that. Again, this is you know, sort of a little bit high level definition stuff, right? Then there's frame relay and ATM. An ATM is not the machine that you get money from. It's called asynchronous transfer mode. So what circuit switch is, it's kind of like your old school telephone, <laughs> right? What happens is you have a dedicated line with, let's say, another caller. Like, let's say I call, let's say, mom, right? And it's a dedicated path of communications. I have exclusive access to it. And what happens is it, it's, it's my channel and I can convey information. Now, the problem is what happens is in, in things like, a, like th those scenarios are that you're using up other resources from other folks. You're not, multi, um, um, uh, you're not supporting as much multiple access than, say, something packet switch, which is kind of what your computers do with packets, um, where you have a bit of information. It's in the packet. It has a header. So it contains, let's say, information of where it should go. It should also contain, let's say, information that helps recover any data that might be corrupted in what we call the payload, which is the other half of that packet. And then it gets sent out over the internet, multiple packets. And we don't care if it arrives in sequence or not. We kind of stitch things together as they come. It's because internet is a best effort network, right? If it can't get data across, Mm, you can't get data across, right? So packet switching, your data can be sent out of sequence. It's small packets instead of a dedicated logical link like a circuit switch 
link. And what happens is they get routed from server to server to server to server until it reaches its destination. Okay? So both, both models are kind of interesting, but what we're kind of like where we're heading, especially nowadays, are things like this: frame relaying and ATM. What frame relaying and ATM, more importantly, what they do is frame relaying is packet switching, kind of, but what happens, but instead of having the large overhead channels, what you instead do, or overhead, uh, like you know, those um, uh, headers and such, what, what instead what you do is you, you kind of, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, what, what it does is like, you, you have these sort of uniform amounts of information. That's more like with ATM, you have these cells. And especially with ATM, what you do is you take, let's say, information from different users that might have different requirements and different amounts of data, you divvy them up into cells, and then those cells are all synchronous, right? But let's say you have this mishmash of data coming in at different rates and different amounts and different sizes, but they all follow the same cell size. So, oh, that's going to take five cells, that'll take ten, that'll take one, and everything is synchronized according to cells, not packet size. And that way, you can support multiple types of traffic of different rates of different amounts of data to get from point A to point B, especially if you have multiple points all trying to coexist with each other. That's why ATM is so powerful. So, what happens is you might have packet or circuit switch or whatever, but what you're doing is you're taking the packets and divvying them up into these smaller units. Okay. Local area networks you should be familiar with. How many people here have their own? Yes. Yes. Um, would something like HDMI be circuit switching because you lose the, the whole picture if it doesn't quite come through? <sighs> well, HDMI, it's not, it, well, it is a communication system. Uh, it's one on one, as far as I know. So the, so the cable is a medium. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, that's a direct path, so that would I would consider that to be. I, I really don't know what the format is, okay. but I, I would need to look into it. But I know that because because that that would follow. I have to think what standard video standard it would be using. But let's say the things that get corrupted at the end, like those uh, MPEG errors and stuff, like the bring blotches and stuff. Um, well, that might be attributed to either one of several things. Like let's say the microprocessor, the image processor, one end or decoding it at the other, and it's just not handling it fast enough. But I would have to look into it some more. Good question. So, the, yep. Yep. So, like, for instance, if you have a really complex network, like, let's say, LTE, and you have, let's say, let's say someone that's file sharing, someone who's doing speech communications, like, let's say, so voice, and file sharing use totally different sizes, amounts of information, bandwidths, rates. So if, let's say you have a bunch of voice users. You also have a bunch of streaming users. You have streaming videos. What ends up happening is you have all these different rates of traffic, different, different actually quality of assurances, uh, like quality of service as well. So what you have is a network trying to support all these different types of traffic all at the same time. That's where ATM would be used. That's a good question. Thank you. All right. So local area networks, you should all be familiar with, with Wi-Fi. And then the metropolitan area networks I mentioned is kind of like the, um, like, you know, across a small town. But lastly, we'll leave off with this, ARPANET, or the internet, which we all use from day in, day out. And, I, and again, we'll be talking more about, a lot more about TCP IP at the end of this course. And um, things to remember is that the internet was initially, was a Department of Defense project that evolved into what we have today. It's very resilient and consists of a number of things from workstations, servers, hosts, and the like. The lab, the, the hands-on experiment that we'll be doing, we'll be looking at that structure. And um, yeah, I, I, again, we'll be looking at this in more detail. So with that said, uh, see you all tomorrow. Hopefully this online lecture thing will be working, so if it's not, uh, please let me know. And uh, yeah, see you tomorrow.
stop capture.